Hello and welcome to our final lesson. This week we're going to talk, finish talking about calculus. We'll start by talking about the most important idea in calculus, that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. We'll, you, we'll look at a technique for more difficult integrals called the substitution method. And then we'll finish today with an application. We'll use integrals to calculate the area between curves. First, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Last week, we talked about using Riemann sums to calculate a definite integral. But we don't want to do this every week. We want a, every time we'd have to calculate a definite integral. We want a better way. We have a very important theorem called the fundamental theorem of calculus. If you can only memorize one theorem about calculus for the exams, it should be this one. This is the important one. First of all, let's suppose we have a continuous function defined on a closed interval. Part one of the theorem says, then the function capital F defined using this formula is continuous on the same closed interval and differentiable on the open interval from A to B. In other words, the integral from A to X of our continuous function small f of t is continuous and differentiable. And part two of the theorem says that if we know any antiderivative, capital F of small f, then the definite integral from A to B of small f is equal to the antiderivative capital F calculated at B minus the antiderivative capital F calculated at A. That's two important ideas, part one and part two. First, let's talk about part one of the theorem. Part one of the theorem tells us how to differentiate an integral. It tells us that the derivative of the integral from a to x at f of t is just f of x. Let me just check that I included that on the slide. I've, I've missed it, there's a typo here. And, and it doesn't finish, f prime is equal to small f. So we're going to use this formula. We're going to use the formula that the derivative of an integral is just equal to the integral. For example, find dy dx if y is equal to the integral from a to x, t cubed plus 1 dt. This is very easy. We don't need to calculate the integral first and then differentiate. All we do is we take the integrand, in this case that's t cubed plus 1, and we, we replace the t by x. Instead of t cubed plus 1, the answer is x cubed plus 1. Let's do another one. Find dy dx if y is the integral from 1 to x, sine t dt. Again, we have the same type of question. We have a number at the bottom. The lower limit is 1. The upper limit is x. And then there's some function of t. To answer this question, all we do is we take the integrand, here it's sine t, and we replace the t by x. The answer is sine x. That's all we're doing here. We're just replacing t by x. If we integrate first and then we differentiate, we have the same function that we started with. But just with the dummy variable t replaced by x. Find dy dx if y is equal to the integral from 0 to x of sine of the natural logarithm of tan of e to the power t squared dt. Uh, when, first, when people first see this, they think they're scared because they think 
sine of log of tan of e to the power t squared. I think this is a complicated function. How is this possible? How am I going to calculate this integral? But you don't need to calculate the integral. All you need to do to answer this question is replace t by x. There's a t here. We're just going to replace this by x. The answer to this question is sine of log of tan of e to the power x squared. That's all we're doing. If we integrate first and then we differentiate, we can imagine these cancelling out and we have the same function that we started with. This one's a little bit harder. Find dy dx if y is the integral from x to 5, free t, sine t, d2. Why is this harder? It's harder because now we have x in the lower limit of integration. The theorem only works if we have x at the top. If we have x at the bottom, we can't use the theorem straight away. But that's okay. We know that we can always swap the positions of the limits of integration, the x and the 5. We can swap their positions as long as we add a minus sign in the front. So we have the derivative of minus the integral from a number, it doesn't matter what it is, in this case it's 5, but it really doesn't matter, to x, 3t sine t dt. And all we do is we replace the t by x. The answer is minus 3x sine x. Another one which is a little bit harder still. Find dy dx if y is the integral from 1 to x squared cos t dt. This time we need to use the chain rule because we don't just have x in the top position, we don't have x as the upper limit of integration, we have a function of x. So here we have a function of a function of so we use the chain rule. And we're going to use the substitution, u is equal to x squared. Then by the chain rule, dy dx is equal to dy du, du dx, where dy du is the derivative of the integral from 1 to u. And we know how to do this. If we just have a, a letter at the top, we know how to calculate the derivative of the integral. We just replace t by u. And then in the second bracket, of course, we have the derivative of x squared, which of course is just 2x. So the answer is 2x cos x squared. So that's part one of the theorem. Part one says if we integrate first and then we differentiate, we just end up with the same function that we started with, but we replace the dummy variable by x. So Let's talk about part two of the theorem. Part two of the theorem tells us how to calculate the definite integral of a function f over a closed interval from a to b. Step one, we need to find an antiderivative of f. It could be any antiderivative, it doesn't matter. We don't need to find the general antiderivative, just any antiderivative. And then we're going to calculate capital F of b minus capital F of a. Because we're going to be using this a lot, it's useful to have a neater notation rather than writing f of b minus f of a. I'm going to be using the notation square bracket, f of x square bracket from a to b, any time I want to have f of b minus f of a. For example, calculate the integral from 0 to pi of cos x dx. We need an antiderivative of cos. I'm going to use sine because the derivative of sine is cos. The integral from 0 to pi cos x dx is sine x calculated at 0 and at pi. In other words, it's sine pi minus sine 0 or 0 minus 0 or 0. The integral from 0 to pi of cos x dx is 0. There's another typo here, there should be a dx just here. Okay. 
Find the integral from minus pi over 4 to 0 sec x tan x dx. An antiderivative of sec x tan x is sec x. So we're calculating sec 0 minus sec minus pi over 4. The answer is 1 minus root 2. The integral from 1 to 4, 3 over 2, square root of x minus 4 over x squared dx. We need an antiderivative of 3 over 2 square root of x. One antiderivative is x to the power 3 over 2. I'll leave that for you to check. And we need an antiderivative of minus 4 over x squared. An antiderivative of minus 4 over x squared is 4 over x. So we're calculating this function in the square brackets at 4 and at 1. First, I'm going to use the top number, 4, to get 4 to the power of 3 over 2, plus 4 divided by 4. And then I'm going to use the lower number, that's the number 1, to get minus 1 to the power of 3 over 2, plus 4 over 1. And when we calculate this, when we simplify this, we find that the answer is 4. There's another idea for this section, the idea of total M. Let's talk first about the function x squared minus 4. And I'm interested in integrating this between minus 2 and 2. Antiderivative of x squared minus 4 is x cubed over 3 minus 4x. So we're calculating this function at first at 2, and then we're doing minus this function calculated at minus 2. And we find that we have minus 32 over 3. If we say that all area is positive area, if we say that all the area underneath the graph of a function, even if the function is negative, is counted as positive area, then we have an idea called total area. We say that the total area between the graph of this function and the x-axis over this closed interval from minus 2 to 2 is plus 32 over 3. Another example, slightly different function. Suppose we look at g of x is equal to 4 minus x squared. We can calculate the integral of this function between minus 2 and 2, and we get a positive number, 32 over 3. We say that the total area between the graph of this function and the x-axis over the closed interval from minus 2 to 2 is plus 32 over 3. Here are some graphs of these functions. On the left, I have the function f, and on the right, I have the function g. On the, the function f is a negative function between minus 2 and 2, so the integral is a negative number. If we say all area is positive, the area, the total area that I've shaded blue in this picture, is 32 over 3. Looking at the right picture, the, fun the function g, the second one, here the function is a positive function, and the integral is thus a positive number. If we say all area is positive, it doesn't matter if we have positive integral or negative integral, we could say it's all positive. Total area in the right hand picture is also 32 over 3. Because, of course, the right hand picture is just minus 1 multiplied by the left picture. For example, let f of x be equal to sine x. I want to calculate two things. First, the definite integral of f over the closed interval from 0 to 2 pi. And I want to calculate the total area between the graph of this function and the x-axis over this interval. First, let's calculate the definite integral. Here's a graph of this function. Intuitively, if we say that some area is positive and some area is negative, we expect positive number plus negative number to cancel out and be zero. So we're going to ex expect the integral to be zero. But if we say all area is positive, we'll have a positive area plus a positive area, 
we're expecting to get a positive number for the total area. And here we go. First, we calculate the integral and we get zero. That's what we expected from the picture. And then I want to calculate the total area. I'm going to go back to the previous slide. I'm going to make a cut. I'm going to cut the picture into two by cutting in the middle. And I'm going to calculate the area on the left. I'm going to calculate the area on the right. And then I'm going to add them together. I'm going to calculate the integral between 0 and pi. This is going to be a positive number, so I don't need absolute value signs. And then I'm going to calculate the integral from pi to 2 pi. Because this is going to be a negative number, I'm adding these absolute value signs around it to turn it into a positive number. And I'm going to leave this calculation for you to check. You can check that the answer that we get for the total area, which I shaded in the previous slide, is 4. So let's summarize. To find the total area between the graph of a function and the x-axis over a closed interval from A to B, we're going to divide or cut our interval at the points where the function is equal to 0. We're going to calculate the integral of f on each one of these sub-intervals. And then we're going to add up the absolute values of the integrals. Let's do one more example. Find the total area between the graph of y is equal to x cubed minus x squared minus 2x and the x-axis for x between minus 1 and 2. We have the function x cubed minus x squared minus 2x. The first thing, first question to ask is, where is this function equal to 0? So we start by calculating 0 is equal to f of x. And when we factorize the function, we have 0 is equal to x, x plus 1, or x minus 2. So the function is equal to 0 if x is 0, if x is minus 1, or if x is equal to 2. So we're going to take our interval. Remember, we go from minus 1 to 2. And we're going to make some cuts at the point where the function is equal to 0. 0, the function 0, so we're going to cut just here. The function is equal to 0 and minus 1, but that's an endpoint. We don't need to worry about that. And the function is also equal to 0, 2. But again, that's an endpoint. We don't need to worry about that. We've cut into two smaller intervals, the interval from minus 1 to 0, and also the interval from 0 to 2. We're going to calculate the integral of each one of these subintervals, and then we're going to add them together. First, between minus 1 and 0, we calculate this integral, and we get 5 over 12. I will leave this for you to check when you rewatch the video or when you read the lecture notes. Let's move on quickly to the next one. We also need to calculate the integral between 0 and 2. And again, I'm going to leave it for you to check that the answer is minus 8 over 3. So to recap, the red section, we have integral of 5 over 12. And the blue part, we have the integral minus 8 over 3. We want to add together the absolute values of these numbers. The absolute value of 5 over 12 plus the absolute value of minus 8 over 3. And we get the answer. The total area which is shaded red or blue in this picture is 37 over 12. Very briefly, I want to talk about the average value of a continuous function. 
we know from high school how to take the average of a set of numbers. For example, if I said find the average of 1, 2, 2, 6, and 9, we know that we add these numbers up and then we divide by the number of numbers. We know that we get 4. We can also calculate the average value of the continuous function. Instead of adding numbers together, we're going to be using the integral. The formula is the average value of f on the closed interval from a to b is 1 divided by b minus a multiplied by the integral from a to b f of x dx. Instead of adding some numbers together, we're going to be doing an integral. You'll remember from last week that integral really means limit of the Riemann sum. So this is the equivalent of adding numbers together. And instead of dividing by how many numbers we have, we're going to be dividing by the width of our integral. But otherwise, the idea is the same. Find the average value of the square root of 4 minus x squared on the closed interval from minus 2 to 2. We need the integral from minus 2 to 2 of this function. I'll leave it for you to check whether this is a 2 pi. And then we use our formula. The average value of f is the width of 1 divided by the width of the interval. That's 1 divided by 2 minus minus 2 multiplied by our integral. And we end up with the answer pi over 2. Here is a picture of this function. The red line is pi over 2. That's the average value of a function. This, this picture might look wrong to you before if you're thinking about area. Yes, there's more area underneath the red line as, than is above it. But that's the wrong way to intuitively think about it. A better way would, to think about it would be how much of the, in, on how much of the interval are we above the line on how much of the interval are we below the line. And then you can start to see that these are roughly the same. So intuitively, this looks roughly right. One more example. Find the average value of x cubed minus x on the closed interval from 0 to 1. This is just a case of taking the right formula and putting the function and the numbers in. So one, my, 1 divided by b minus a, in this case 1 divided by 1 minus 0, multiplied by an integral from 0 to 1, g of x dx. And I'll leave this for to check. The answer is minus 1 quarter. Again, here's a picture. Again, if we go, if we imagine going up at the points where the red line crosses the blue curve, this part in red is roughly the same as this orange bit on the left and this orange bit on the right. So intuitively, this looks about right. Before I finish this chapter, let me just remind you of the differences between indefinite integrals and definite integrals. First, indefinite integrals. Please remember that an indefinite integral is a function. For example, the indefinite integral of x, the x is x squared over 2 plus c. And the indefinite integral of cos x dx is sine x plus c. For a definite integral, we have almost the same notation. The only difference is we also have numbers, in this case, a and b, upper limit and lower limit of integration. But this is not a function. This is a number. For example, the integral from 0 to 1 of x dx is a half. And the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cos x dx is equal to 1. Our second chapter for today's lesson is the substitution method.
Let me remind you of the chain rule. By the chain rule, we know that dy dx is the same as dy du du dx. And we have a special version of the chain rule for power functions. The derivative of u to the power n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 is equal to u to the power n du dx. We know this is true. This means that we can go backwards. The integral of u to the power n du dx dx must be u to the power n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus a constant c. However, we also know that the indefinite integral of u to the power n du is, equal, is the same function, u to the power n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c. So if these are the same, then these green functions must be the same. du dx dx must be the same as du. And that's the key idea in this section. For example, find x cubed plus x to the power 5 multiplied by 3x squared plus 1 dx. This looks like a complicated integral. We have x cubed plus x to the power 5, and we also have another function, 3x squared plus 1. We want to make this easier for us. And the way that we make this easier is we choose a u. What we do is we look at the integrand and we see there's an x cubed plus x in here. Let's use this. So we make the guess. We say, let's replace this by u. Let u be equal to x cubed plus x, full stop. And then we can do our substitution. The key idea in this chapter is that du is the same as du dx dx. And for this u, du dx is equal to 3x squared plus 1. So what do we have? We have that du is the same as 3x squared plus 1 dx. And look, we have that in our integrand. So really, our integral, x cubed plus x to the power 5, 3x squared plus 1 dx, is just the same as the integral of u to the power 5 du. And then suddenly we realize this is not a difficult integral. This is, in fact, an easy integral. We know the integral of u to the power 5 is u to the power 6 divided by 6 plus a constant. One final thing we need to do. We can't give our answer including u. We need to go back to give our answer involving x. The answer to this question is 1 divided by 6, x cubed plus x to the power 6 plus c. Another one. Find the integral of the square root of 2x plus 1 dx. Again, we look here and we see find a nice easy function hidden inside the integral. There's a 2x plus 1 here. I want to replace 2x plus 1 by u. Then I calculate that du, which is the same as du dx dx, is the same as 2 dx. I don't have a 2 dx in the integral. I only have 1 dx. So I'm going to divide by 2 and say that dx is the same as a half du. And then I'm ready to do the substitution. I have dx is equal to half du. I'm going to replace dx by half du. And I have that u is equal to 2x plus 1. So I'm going to replace 2x plus 1 by u. The integral is the same as the integral of u to the power of a half multiplied by half du. And we know how to calculate this. We know that the answer is 
a half u to the power of 3 over 2 divided by 3 over 2 plus c. Substitute back in 2x plus 1 and simplify a little bit and we get the final answer. 1 third 2x plus 1 to the power of 3 over 2 plus c. So that's the idea. Formally, let me give you the theorem of the substitution method. If we know that u is a differentiable function of x, if we know that g is a function from the real numbers to some interval i, and if we know that f is continuous on this interval i, then we can do the substitution method. The integral of f of g of x multiplied by g prime of x dx is the same as the integral of f of u d. That's the formal formula, but in, pra in practice it's going to be easier to use the method I gave in the previous examples. For example, find the integral of 5 sec squared 5t plus 1 dt. What I do is I look at my integrand and I'm trying to find quite a, a simple-ish function hidden inside here, which I can use for u. I see there's a 5t plus 1. I'm going to use this for u. So the first part of my answer is let u be equal to 5t plus 1. Then I need to calculate du in terms of dt. du is the same as du dt dt or 5 dt. Do I have 5 dt in the integrand? Yes, it's a 5 and a dt. So now I'm ready to go. I'm going to replace 5 dt by du and I'm going to replace 5t plus 1 by u. The integral that we're trying to calculate is the same as the integral of sec squared u du and we know an antiderivative of sec squared u is tan u. So the answer to this question is tan of 5t plus 1 plus c. Another one. Find the integral of cos of 7 theta plus 3 d theta. I need to choose a u. I see there's a 7 theta plus 3 here. So I'm going to choose u is equal to 7 theta plus 3. I need to calculate du in terms of d theta. du is equal to du d theta d theta, which is 7 d theta. I don't have 7 d theta in the integral, I only have 1 d theta. So I'm dividing by 7 and I'm going to use the substitution. d theta is 1 divided by 7 du. And then I'm ready to do my substitution. d theta I'm replacing by 1 over 7 du. We don't need the 1 over 7 inside the integral, so might as well take that outside. And I'm going to replace 7 theta plus 3 by u. I need to calculate 1 divided by 7 multiplied by the integral of cos u d u. And of course that's 1 over 7 sine u plus c, or 1 over 7 sine of 7 theta plus 3 plus c. Another one, find the integral of x squared sine x cubed. I need to choose a u. I'm going to choose u is equal to x cubed because I want to have sine of u. Sine of u is much easier to deal with than sine of x cubed. And then I do du is equal to du dx dx or 3x squared dx. Do I have 3x squared dx in the, integ in the integral? No, I don't. I have 1x squared dx. So I'm going to divide by 3 and use the formula 1 over 3 du is equal to x squared dx. I replace x squared dx by 1 over 3 dx. 
and of course I replace x cubed by u. Let me move to the next example. I'll leave this for you to read later. Find the integral of x, square root of 2x plus 1, dx. We need a u. I'm going to choose u is 2x plus 1. That looks about right. Then du is equal to 2dx. I don't have a 2dx, so I'm dividing by 2. I'm going to need to use the substitution. dx is equal to half du. And I find that the integral I'm trying to calculate is the integral of x square root of u a half du. But wait a minute, there's still an x here. I, don't, I can't go any further until I get rid of this x. I need to replace all of the x's by a function of u. What can I do? Well, remember, we started with u is equal to 2x plus 1. That's the same as saying a half multiplied by u minus 1 is equal to x. I'm going to take this formula for x and I'm going to substitute it in just here. Instead of x, I'm going to have a half of half of u minus 1 here. And this is okay, because u multiplied by square root of u is u to the power of 3 over 2, and minus 1 multiplied by the square root of u is u to the power of a half. We know how to integrate these two functions. I'm going to leave the rest of the calculation for you to check. You can check that the answer to this question is 1 over 10, 2x plus 1 to the power 5 over 2, minus 1 over 6, 2x plus 1 to the power 3 over 2. And then, as always, when we do an indefinite integral, plus c on the end. And in an exam, there are points for plus c, if I give you a question like this. If you don't write the plus c on the end, you lose points. Find the integral of 2z divided by the cubed root of z squared plus 1 dz. We need to do a substitution. Makes sense that we choose u is equal to z squared plus 1. So the first line of my answer, a nice little sentence, let u be equal to z squared plus 1, the full stop. Then du is equal to 2z dz. That's okay. I have 2z, 2z dz in my integral. Look, here's a 2z dz. I can replace that by du. So I have the integral of du divided by u to the power of a third, or the integral of u to the power minus a third du. Again, I'll leave this for you to check. When you reread, when you read your lecture notes or rewatch this lecture, pause the video, just check through the details, check that the answer is 3 over 2, z squared plus 1 to the power of 2 thirds plus c. Find the integral of sine squared x dx. This time we're going to need to use an identity. And we're going to use the identity sine squared x is equal to 1 minus cos 2x divided by 2. So really we're calculating the integral half multiplied by the integral of 1 minus cos 2x dx. We can calculate this using the substitution. I haven't written all the details here. I'm leaving for this for you to in the details, I'm just going to use the substitution u is equal to 2x here. Or if we already know an antiderivative of cos 2x, we can just jump straight away and say it's a half sine 2x. Similarly, 
the integral of cos squared x dx when calculated in the same way. This one I leave to you to check as well. Please try to write down a full answer to this example. So far, we've been talking about indefinite integrals. There's also a substitution method for definite integrals. The theorem is almost the same. We start the same way. U needs to be differentiable, G prime must be continuous, and F must be continuous. And the formula at the bottom is almost the same. Integral of f of g of x, g prime of x dx is the integral of f of u du. But there's one difference here. When we do the substitution, we must also change the limits of integration. a and b, we must change to g of a and g of b. For example, calculate the integral from minus 1 to 1 of 3x squared, square root of x cubed plus 1, dx. I'm going to solve this in two different ways. First, I'm going to use the theorem on previous slide. The answer starts just here. First, we need to choose a u. I'm going to choose x cubed plus 1. Then we calculate du in terms of dx. du is equal to du dx dx or 3x squared dx. Okay, that's exactly as we were doing for indefinite integrals. At this point, we need to do the extra step. We need to change the limits of integration. Instead of minus 1 at the bottom, we want a different number. What does x equal to minus 1 mean in terms of u? Remember, u is equal to x cubed plus 1. And if x is equal to minus 1, we have minus 1 cubed plus 1. Minus 1 cubed is equal to minus 1 plus 1, we get 0 x equal to minus 1 is the same as u equal to 0. And we need to change the upper limit of integration. Instead of 1, we need a different number here. Instead of x equal to 1, put 1 into the formula, u is equal to x cubed plus 1, or 1 cubed plus 1. That means that u must be 2. So when we do the substitution, Instead of x equal to 1 at the top, or just 1, we replace this by u equal to 2. And instead of minus 1 on the bottom, or if we want to be more precise, x is equal to minus 1 on the bottom, we replace this by u is equal to 0. When you write your answers to the questions like this, you don't have to write x equal to and u equal to here. I like to just write this so that I don't get confused. So I know when I'm doing x variable and when I'm doing u variable. So that's completely up to you if you do this style or if you just write the numbers. And then the rest of the substitution is the same as we've been doing in the previous section. x cubed plus 1 we replaced by u. 3x squared dx we replaced with just du. So we need to calculate the integral from 0 to 2 of the square root of u du. We're calculating 2 thirds u to the power of 3 over 2, calculated at 2 and at 0. First use the top number 2, we get 2 to the power of 3 over 2, and then use the bottom number 0, 0 to the power of 3 over 2. That's 2 thirds, 2 multiplied by root 2, or 4 root 2 over 3. Now let's save this example, let's solve this example in a different method. This time first I'm going to find the indefinite integral and then I'm going to put the limits in to find the definite integral that we want. So forget everything on the previous slide, we're going to start again. 
I'm going to do the substitution using to execute to plus one, and that means I must have du is 3x squared dx. So my indefinite integral of 3x squared, square root of x squared plus 1 dx, becomes just the indefinite integral of square root of u du. And I can calculate that this is the same as 2 thirds of x cubed plus 1 to about 3 over 2 plus c. So that's step one. First, find the indefinite integral. And then step two, we're going to find the required definite integral. Now we put the numbers in. The numbers are minus one and one. That's x is minus one and x is one. Now we know an antiderivative of our integrand. We know that an antiderivative is 2 thirds x cubed plus 1 to the power of 3 over 2. We're going to calculate this antiderivative at 1 and at minus 1. And I'll leave it for you to check that we get the same answer as before. We get 4 root 2 over 3. In solution 1, I did a little bit of extra work at the start when I changed the limits of integration. But then I did everything in one calculation. In this example, I've broken it up into two. First, I did the indefinite integral. And then I had to do a bit of extra work at the end to put the limits of integration in. It's completely up to you which method you choose to use. For example, calculate the integral from pi over 4 to pi over 2, cotan theta, cosec squared, theta, d theta. We need to make a substitution, and there's two choices here. I could either choose cotan theta, or I could choose cosec theta. And it's not obvious which one to use. You just pick one, see if it works. If it doesn't work, we start again and we choose the other. For this problem, it turns out the substitution that we want to use is cotan theta. So I'm going to start my answer with let u be equal to cotan theta. And then the reason this works is because then du is equal to du d theta d theta is equal to minus cosec squared theta d theta. And that's almost what we have in the integral. We have a cosec squared d theta here. The only difference is I don't have a minus sign here. So instead, I'm going to multiply on both sides by minus 1. And then the substitution I'm going to use is minus du is equal to cosec squared theta d theta. Now, I also need to substitute the limits of integration. The lower limit of integration is theta is equal to pi over 4. If theta is equal to pi over 4, then u is equal to the cotan of pi over 4, which is equal to 1. For the upper limit of integration, theta equal to pi over 2 implies that u is equal to cotan of pi over 2, which is equal to 0. So I can replace the lower limit. Instead of theta is pi over 4, I can replace this with u equal to 1. And the upper limit, instead of theta is pi over 2, I can replace this with u equal to 0. Other than that, the method is the same. Replace cotan theta by u, replace cosec squared theta d theta by minus du. And then I leave this for you to check. The answer to this question is a half. The final chapter of this course is about the area between curves. Let's suppose we have two functions, a function f and a function g. And we want to calculate the 
area between these two functions for x between a and b. In other words, we want to calculate the area that I've shaded in blue here. And when we do this, we use the idea of total area. We want to consider all area here to be positive area. The definition is, if we have two continuous functions, f and g, and if between a and b at least, the bigger function is called f and the smaller function is called g. Then the area of the curve, area bit that's trapped between or enclosed between these two curves, for x between a and b, is the integral from a to b, f of x minus g of x. In this final chapter, we're going to be using this formula. For example, find the area between y is equal to 2 minus x squared and y is equal to minus x. Here's the picture. The bigger curve, the blue curve, is y is equal to 2 minus x squared. And the smaller curve, that's the red curve, is y is equal to minus x. Before we know, before we use the integral, we need to calculate the limits of integration, the a and the b. In other words, we need to calculate where do these two curves intersect. We need to calculate for what are values of x are the two functions the same. When do we have 2 minus x squared is equal to minus x. And the answer is minus 1 and 2 go back. That means this number here must be minus 1 and this number here must be 2. Okay, so we're going to integrate from minus 1 to 2. And we're going to be integrating bigger function, that's 2 minus x squared, minus smaller function, or minus minus x. And that's all to say. That's all I need to say here. I'll leave it for you to check that the answer is 9 over 2. Area between curves, which is a type of total area, must always be a positive number. If I give you a question like this and you get a negative number, then you know you've made a mistake. The answer must always be a positive number. Here's another example. Find the area bounded by y is equal to the square root of x. That's this top curve shown in blue. y is equal to x minus 2. That's the straight line on the right, which is colored red. And the x-axis. The x-axis is this part down the bottom. And we're calculating this area for x greater than or equal to 0 and y greater than or equal to 0. To answer this question, I'm going to calculate the blue area and the red area separately, and then I'm going to add them together. The first thing we need to do is, what is this number? This number I've written with, with a question mark. What is the value of x where the two functions intersect? So after this, we start with square root of x equal to x minus 2. Square both sides, x is equal to x minus 2 squared, or x squared minus 4x plus 4. Subtract x from both sides, and we find 0 is equal to x minus 1, x minus 4. These two lines intersect when x is equal to 1 or x is equal to 4. Only one of these numbers could be correct. Is it 1 or is it 4? Let's test 1 first of all. If I put 1 here, square root of 1 is 1, and on the right hand side 1 minus 2 is minus 1. That can't be right, that's not right. So it must be the other one, it must be 4. 
or go back to the picture in the picture this number is this number one or is this number four can't be one must be four so what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the blue area and then we're going to do add on the red area the blue area it's rating between 0 and 2, and the top function is square root of x, the bottom function is 0. So we're just doing the integral from 0 to 2 of the square root of x. For the red area, x goes between 2 and 4, so we're integrating between 2 and 4. The bigger function is square root of x, the smaller function is x minus 2. So to answer this question, we need the integral from 0 to 2, square root of x dx, plus the integral from 2 to 4 of square root of x minus x minus 2 dx. You know how to calculate these now, so I'll just skip through the calculation. I'll leave this for you to check. When you, when you re-watch this, when you do your revision, whatever, Please check that there's no mistakes here, and please check that the answer is 10 divided by 3. And that is the end of this course. Are there any questions? No, the exam is not multiple choice. It will be, you wouldn't have to show the workings to your, to your answers. There will be three questions, you will have 30 minutes for each question. It will be broken up like the previous one, but this time you will need to write your answers. You need to, to write your answers on a piece of paper showing your method, and then upload a picture of your work. 